All right, so welcome back to Math 7280, our course on asymptotics and perturbation methods. So today I wanted to try something a little different, not so characteristic of this course, um, which was to talk about some of the dangerous things that can happen if you don't know what you're doing when working with asymptotics. There are some pitfalls, there are some traps, um, there can be monsters under the bed. So I want you to be aware of them. We're not gonna spend most of our time worrying about things like that, because actually there really aren't very many monsters under the bed. Uh, so we'll just take the attitude that things will work out generally for us. And if they don't, we'll notice because we'll see something bad happening. Um, but so let me at least alert you to what some of these possible dangers could be. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Good. All right, so um, properties of asymptotic series. I, I sort of felt like I had to give you a lecture of this type because of something that the great mathematician Abel said back in 1828, which is that divergent series are the invention of the devil. And it's shameful to base on them any demonstration whatsoever. Um, he did pioneering work in, in divergent series. Uh, nevertheless, they, he recognized, as did Euler and others um, who used them, that they could be, um, they could be finicky tools, <laughs> the, the invention of the devil. All right, so let me try to explain why anyone would say something like that. To read about these ideas, this theoretical uh, work, you could look at Bender and Orsog's book, section 3.8, goes into some of the theory. And also the book I mentioned in the first lecture by uh, E.J. Hinch called Perturbation Methods. He spends chapter two on this topic. All right, so remember last time we talked about uh, convergent versus asymptotic series. I just wanna remind you about that distinction before we get rolling. So the distinction is, you know, suppose we had some kind of series like this, the nth partial sum, we're, we're summing up some functions. Um, we've got coefficients a, j. Consider this some, you know, n term approximation to a given function f. Now, it would be a convergent approximation if the nth partial sum approaches f of x. Key point being it approaches it as the number of terms goes to infinity while we're keeping x fixed. All right, so that's the usual concept from first year calculus um, of convergence, but asymptotic does things sort of in the opposite sense, you might say, that um, to say Sn is asymptotic to f of x, that would be a statement that would be made as a point x is moving to some base point x zero, which is often going to be zero or infinity for us. And this is happening as, um, this is happening for each fixed n. So you see the distinction. In one case, you hold x fixed, let n go to infinity. In the other case, you hold n fixed and let x approach its uh, base point x0, where the expansion is taking place around that point x0. So that's the difference. And, um, you know, as I mentioned last time, we'll frequently just take one term in our asymptotic expansion or, or very few terms. We're not going to, the fact that these series are often divergent isn't going to cause us much trouble because we're not going to take infinitely many terms. All right, so that's just a little reminder. Now, to get into some of these properties of asymptotics, uh, let me say comment two. Let's start talking about the issue of uniqueness of an asymptotic representation. Okay, so remember we have this concept of um, an asymptotic sequence of functions. So I'm going to phrase this uniqueness issue relative to some given asymptotic sequence. 
which last time we called phi j of x, this collection of functions. So hopefully you remember how that works, that the, the first one is supposed to be big. You know, you've got in some sense, phi one of x would be much greater than phi two of x, which is much greater than phi three of x and so on as x is approaching x zero. Right, like in our example in the last lecture, we had one over x was the leading term that's much bigger as x goes to infinity than one over x squared, right, which decays faster and so on. Okay, so anyway, let's suppose we expand um, our function f in terms of this asymptotic sequence. So if our f of x is asymptotic to, let's say, a1 phi 1x plus a2 phi 2x plus and so on, um, the claim is that those coefficients a1, a2, et cetera, those are unique, they're uniquely determined, um, which is sort of what you would hope. So the expansion is unique for that particular sequence of phi's. Now, you might not really understand at this point, what's the issue? I mean, how could it be otherwise? Um, Still, these are the kinds of weird things you have to worry about with asymptotic behavior. Like, is it conceivable that you could have relative to these basis functions, I might call them basis functions, the phi's, that um, you could have two different sets of coefficients and yet both series could be asymptotic to the same f. That cannot happen. And, and the reason that it can't happen is we can uniquely determine the coefficients by a certain little calculation. So I'll do that in a second, but that's going to be the logic. The aj are uniquely determined by an explicit calculation. And the calculation essentially follows from our definition of what it means to be asymptotic. So like, let's suppose we wanted to determine the a1. So we know that f of x is asymptotic if we just take the first term that has to be a valid statement f of x is asymptotic to that as it's going to be understood throughout that in all these cases x is going to x zero but given this um, fact that just one term gives you an asymptotic relation that lets you determine a1 because you could solve for it as a1 is going to be the limit as x goes to x zero of f of x divided by phi one of x. Nice easy little calculation, but that's what the asymptotic symbol means, that that ratio has this property. Maybe I should pause here. Does anyone wanna ask anything about anything in the lecture so far? Either in the chat or out loud? You're good. Two terms or three terms? Would the results still be the same? Um, we sorry. Was that you, Maria? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey there. Um, what did you ask? I that's only one term. I want to do more terms. But what was your question? So also, yeah, that that was the question. If uh, we yeah. Well, let's determine a two. Okay. Right. Yeah. So how would we get a two? So the the statement then is um, well. Here's how we'll get it. So let's determine A2 by doing this little observation that when we say that F of X is also asymptotic to A1 phi one of X plus A2 phi two of X, that's also true. That tells us how to determine A2 because we would then look at f of x, subtract off the leading term, 
divide that by um, phi two and take that limit as um, x goes to x zero and that will give us a two. Uh, can so we interpret this, this process as a Gram-Schmidt process? <laughs> this reminds you of the Gram-Schmidt process in its recursive nature, like when you're finding uh, a basis. Let's see, Gram-Schmidt, remind me, is that the one where I'm supposed to find an orthogonal basis or an orthonormal basis given yes. a set of independent vectors? Yes. Is that what it is? I forget. Yeah, that's what it is. It's got some of that same flavor in that it's recursive. Um, I should be careful about using the word basis because these functions don't really form a basis for the space of functions in the way that basis vectors would for a vector space. Um, but this is they're commonly called basis functions in a looser sense. They're sometimes called scale functions or gauge functions. So I'm just using asymptotic terminology, but don't take it too literally in a, a vector space sense. Anyway, so you can determine the various A's through this kind of procedure, and they're uniquely determined by this procedure. So let me give you a little example of how you would do a calculation like this, just to show you that it's not just theoretical. Um, let me consider uh, the following three functions. I mean, let's actually, I've been talking mostly about X, but sometimes we'll talk about a small epsilon as a parameter that will come up a lot in the course. So let me introduce that kind of language. Um, let's think about for small epsilon, the fact that cosine of epsilon is much greater than sine of epsilon, which is much greater than sine squared of epsilon. This is all as epsilon goes to zero. It's sort of a weird choice of three functions. Um, you might be in your head thinking about, be thinking of the Taylor expansion or the Maclaurin expansion that cosine of epsilon is like one or one minus epsilon squared over two factorial or whatever. Um, sine of epsilon is about like epsilon. Sine squared of epsilon would be like epsilon squared. So just thinking in those familiar terms with powers of epsilon, you can see this statement is true. But let's just pick these funky trigonometric functions and ask ourselves just for curiosity, could we, um, suppose we wanted to represent, I don't know why we ever would, but just go with this. I'm bringing this up just to make a certain point about uniqueness and non-uniqueness. I'll make that point shortly. So as we wanted to represent something like, say, the square root of nine plus epsilon and expand it in terms of these three functions. We wanna write it as um, square root of nine plus epsilon as some coefficient a1, uh, I guess I could call it phi1, plus a2 phi2 plus a3 phi3, plus terms of little o in the last retained term. Remember, little o means asymptotically smaller. And here are the phi's, I meant the ones that I just wrote down. So a1 cosine epsilon, plus a2 sine epsilon plus a3 sine of epsilon all squared plus stuff of smaller order. Um, let's say plus, oops. Um, actually, let's make that a little low. Of sine squared. Epsilon. Okay, so can we determine the coefficients a1, a2, a3 to give an asymptotic approximation for small epsilon? So, of course, we can do that by the procedure I just mentioned, the theoretical procedure above. We could grind out, calculate a1 
that should be the limit as epsilon goes to zero of, um, so I'll take square root plus epsilon over a cosine of epsilon. And, you know, that's like the kind of thing we assign to people in their first calculus course. Um, in this case, you can just plug in epsilon equals zero because it's not, <laughs> it's not even a L'Hopital's rule situation. It's just square root of nine over one. So that goes to three. Okay, that one was easy. Now let's do A2. So then I should take limit as epsilon goes to zero of square root of nine plus epsilon. Then I subtract off the leading term, which I've just calculated to be three cosine epsilon, and then put that whole thing over a denominator of sine epsilon. Now that is going to give us a zero over zero. So that one is suitable for L'Hopital's rule. And using L'Hopital's rule or asking Mathematica to do it or whatever, you get one sixth. You could trust me on that. So I just did it this morning and it, it, I'm pretty sure that's right. And finally, to do A3, limit as epsilon goes to zero. Now we subtract off two terms. So square root of nine plus epsilon minus three cosine epsilon minus one sixth sine of epsilon. And then that's divided by sine squared of epsilon because we're interested in that coefficient for sine squared. And that I don't recommend doing by hand um, based on having asked Mathematica to do it. And it told me that the answer was 323 over 216. Not obvious. <laughs> um, okay, so supposedly we've got a series here that is um, gonna give us a good asymptotic approximation of square root of nine plus epsilon. Now, I wanted to check that because that looked like such a weird number to be coming up with. So um, here's a way that it, I don't know. This is how I thought of checking it. Let's see where this is. So I, here's my Mathematica. Um, I mentioned earlier that I had done this limit there. This is how you would ask Mathematica to do a limit and it gave one sixth. And then here I'm asking it, the one that I just mentioned, subtract off the top, the first two terms up here in the top, sine epsilon squared down there, take the limit, gave me that funky number, 323 over 216. But now as a check, you know, is this reasonable? Of course, no sane person would expand in terms of these functions, right? That This is a very contrived exercise that I'm doing to make the point that you have freedom. You can use any set of gauge functions, any set of um, basis functions you want, as long as they form an asymptotic sequence. The natural sequence is powers of epsilon. And so if you ask Mathematica to do a series expansion of the thing that I just derived, just series expand that for small epsilon, then and take the first two terms or the up to the epsilon squared term. That's what this tells it to do. It gives me this three plus epsilon over six minus epsilon squared over 216. And it knows that the error term is big O of epsilon cubed which it writes in this funny way. Um, and as a comparison, you could just directly do the series expansion on the thing that we were trying to approximate, the square root of nine plus epsilon, and do that to the same number of terms. And the interesting thing is it gives the same result, three plus epsilon over six minus epsilon squared over 216. So what we're learning from that um, or I don't know, you tell me, you want to tell me, what do you feel you learned from that? About either uniqueness or non-uniqueness or whatever. 
Maybe you don't feel you learn much of anything from that. <laughs> are unique, but the phi's are not unique? Yeah, right, that there's a non-uniqueness if you allow yourself the freedom to choose the phi's. So that was the reason I did this absurd little exercise to make this third point about non-uniqueness. Which is if we use a different asymptotic sequence Um, I don't know, maybe I should call them something else, psi j of x or whatever, um, then we can get different coefficients, of course. Which I think is a pretty obvious point to make but um, it's not surprising. I mean, you have to, you have a different basis. So just to underscore that, let me go back to what I calculated up here and just look at these differences. That is the coefficient of the third term, when I used that bizarre trigonometric expansion was this, whereas with a positive sign, by the way, Whereas the coefficient of the third term when I did it with the um, powers of epsilon, I got that with a negative term in front of the epsilon squared. So of course the coefficients depend on the choice of the, the functions in the asymptotic sequence. All right, so Can I, I don't- Can a quick question? Oh yes, please, sure. So um, the reason that the powers of epsilon are an asymptotic sequence is because epsilon is less than one. Is that right? Yes. Whereas we're we're only the, considering yesterday epsilon we had, going to zero. Whereas yesterday we had the reciprocal powers of x, and those right. were asymptotic because x was getting large. Is That's that right? right. Yeah, exactly. I, I, by epsilon, I meant to sort of be very suggestive that I'm thinking of something going to zero. So I think I did say that above, didn't I? That um, all these epsilon limits are epsilon going to zero. So yeah, th this, this whole means calculation that... is this right? This asymptotic sequence is as epsilon goes to zero. So that does the normal like Taylor series expansion is an example mm -hmm. of an asymptotic sequence for the small the small value. Of Excellent. The That's true. All right. Uh, yes, that is true. A convergent Taylor series as X goes to its base point X zero or A or whatever you want to call it, a convergent Taylor series is actually asymptotic as well. So that's, an, that's a very classic example, you know, uh, convergent Taylor series will be also asymptotic, but it's not true that every asymptotic series is convergent. Right, right. But we frequently, when we use Taylor series to approximate things, we're really using their asymptotic character more than their convergent character. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay, now we come to um, the kind of thing that I think... Uh, uh, oh, is there another question? Yeah, um, so I was wondering, so that doesn't mean that every asymptotic, uh, every convergent series is also asymptotic, right? I think it does. It, uh, I mean, it's conver it's asymptotic to the function that it converges to. Ah, okay, okay, makes sense. Yeah, and maybe it's um, worth just writing down. Let's just, I think that's a fair statement. Um, unless I'm overlooking something, but I think that's right. I hadn't planned to mention that, but um, every convergent Taylor series so we're thinking of something like, oh, I don't know. I mean, how do we write it to be like, uh, no, wait, I hadn't thought about this. So I'm supposed to take the nth derivative of f evaluated at a point x0 over n factorial 
n equals zero to infinity. Um, and this thing is supposed to equal f of x in the sense of convergence. Oh, actually, sorry, I have to go x minus x zero to the n. Oops. So if we have that, then, and this is x zero, okay. um, then this is also um, is asymptotic. to f of x as x goes to x zero. Uh, that, that's also true, but you can check that from the definition of asymptotic um, that the remainder term is uh, of a smaller order than the last retained term in the series, if you take a finite series. Okay. And that's yeah. just because these form, I mean, all that we're saying is that uh, I have something like one is much greater than x minus x zero is much greater than x minus x zero squared, et cetera, as x approaches x zero. Um, that's my asymptotic sequence in this case, the powers of x, positive powers of integer powers of x. So just so I'm clear, so would that mean that, for example, a Fourier series would not be an asymptotic expansion mm -hmm. because it's kind of not local? Yeah, very good point, right. The asymptoticity is a local property. It's only in the infinitesimal neighborhood of X zero. So are Fourier series asymptotic or not? Um, I have to think about that. I'm not used to anyone saying anything about that. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not, I, I've, I can't think offhand of why a case where I would talk about the asymptotic aspects of Fourier series. Uh, yeah, well, it seems okay, like I'm it wouldn't be because all the terms have constant magnitude, right? Like each, the, um, they're not ordered in this hierarchical way. Yeah. I mean, what, what orders them is the frequency of their oscillations. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's a different a different sense of, of convergence or approximation. Okay, so this um, comment then was about convergent Taylor series being asymptotic. But was there a different comment or question? Uh, yeah, so, so I was wondering if you pick a function f, can you use any asymptotic series you want to approximate it or is there like a, specific condition that you have to have on that series? Not really, no. So yes, the, the, you mean an asymptotic sequence, uh, right, yeah. the functions, the choice of the asymptotic sequence. No, that was sort of what I was trying to underline with my slightly absurd example with the sine epsilon and sine squared epsilon, that you, as long as you have an asymptotic sequence, you can represent, you can seek an asymptotic expansion of a given function relative to that sequence. But, but some sequences will be more natural in a given context. Okay, but what I'm thinking is that maybe the function has a singularity at some point where you want to approximate it, say it goes to infinity. And then yep. if you choose just functions that are well behaved, I don't know, like x or sine of x, does that affect it? Or? Sing but singularities are good um, um, for us. I mean, we have functions that, that may be blowing up and with using asymptotic methods, we can capture how fast they blow up in terms of basis functions that themselves blow up. Oh, okay. Right, so um, that's very valuable to us to capture behavior near singularities. That's one of the main uses of asymptotic methods. Yeah, so we're not scared of them at all. In fact, we like them. Good things happen near singularities. So actually, let's talk about that because that's sort of the next thing I wanted to go into, which is, um, something really very fundamental to, to asymptotic methods, which are called transcendentally small terms. Now that's a lot of writing. So I'm gonna tend to just write TST. This will come up a fair amount in the course. <clears throat> 
Okay, so, and I think this is the kind of thing Abel had in mind when he talked about the invention of the devil, that, um, so transcendentally small terms are terms, I mean, the comparison being made here is between algebraic objects like powers of X or powers of epsilon and things that are not just simple powers. Those are the transcendental objects. So terms that are much smaller than powers Terms that are much smaller than any non-negative power of epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. Or frequently we'll, as Mark mentioned earlier, in the first lecture we used um, x going to infinity and we were comparing our function to powers of one over x. So we're often gonna look at those too. Um, much smaller than powers of one over x as x goes to infinity. Or in general, you know, we could be considering x going to some other point x zero or epsilon going to some epsilon zero, but commonly it will be epsilon to zero or x to infinity. So terms that are much smaller than any power um, are said to be transcendentally small. Let me say that a little more precisely. So let's just focus on the x case. Um, F of x, is a transcendentally small term if f of x is much less than one over x to the n as x goes to infinity for any um, n greater than or equal to zero. where think of n being some fixed, it could either be a fixed integer or, you know, actually I don't see that I really need it to be an integer. You could imagine fractional powers could be one half, whatever. Um, though often we'll talk about it in the context of integer powers. So when you have an F that's a transcendentally small term, meaning much smaller than a power of one over X, Bender and Orsog don't tend to use that language of transcendentally small, they say, that um, f of x of this type is subdominant to one over x to the n. I don't know that I'll use that language very often. I just mention it so that when you're reading the book, you'll, um, you'll know what they're talking about. So, let me try to say now why transcendentally small terms are important. Oh, I seem to have gotten out of my place. Okay. <laughs> where, I thought I had, where did I write? Gee, I'm way out of order. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, fine. Let's go here for continued. So why this matters, um, the concept of transcendentally small terms, they're important to understand because um, they cause a very serious kind of non-uniqueness. I mean, much more serious than the absurd kind of non-uniqueness we mentioned earlier where we were changing the basis functions. Um, not only do they cause non-uniqueness, they, they can also cause other kinds of trouble. Um, so 
because of this um, non-uniqueness, actually, many different functions, I mean, here's the point, one of the points, many different functions can have the same asymptotic expansion. In fact, infinitely many. So that's kind of scary. I'll maybe I'll say yikes. It's something to be aware of. So what am I talking about? Um, let me give you the classic example of a function that gives rise to a transcendentally small term. Maybe you know of one offhand. Can you think of something offhand that decays much faster than one over x to any power? E to the minus x. Yeah, e to the minus x is the, is the favorite. And that is a transcendentally small term. Right, exponentials decay faster than any power or any inverse power. So um, let's check that. I mean, this is probably familiar to most of you, but just to make sure we're on the same page here. So what we need to do is check that e to the minus x is much less than one over x to the n as x goes to infinity. for any n greater than or equal to zero. So to check that, I mean, this much less than symbol means we're supposed to look at a limit. So let's look at the ratio of um, e to the minus x compared to one over x to the n, which simplifies or However, I mean, you could also write it as x to the n, e to the minus x. So I claim that this goes to zero as x goes to infinity. And there are various ways to see it. Let's think of n being an integer, positive integer for now. I mean, one way you could see it is, um, I mean, this expression right here is of the form zero over zero as x goes to infinity. And so you could use L'Hopital's rule on this. The e to the minus x will differentiate into itself with a negative sign in front. And as you do these, um, you'll get other powers. Uh, or actually, maybe it's even better to do this case. We could do x to the n over e to the x. That would be nice. And then as we keep differentiating x to the n, we're just going down in n, right? We would get n x to the n minus one. So if we just do it n times, eventually this will, the x to the n will differentiate down to a constant, whereas the e to the x will just keep being e to the x. So that, that would be one way to see it. Um, so as I say, you could apply L'Hopital's rule repeatedly to x to the n over e to the x. That would do it. Um, another way that's kind of nice to see what that the limit is zero, it's, it's a little bit quicker, is you could just look at the logarithm of the expression if you look at the natural log of x to the n, e to the minus x, that would be n log x minus x. And if you think about that expression as x goes to infinity, the one thing you need to know is that x grows much faster than log x, which could also be verified by using L'Hopital's rule if you don't already know that. but. But anyway, as x goes to infinity, um, this expression up here tends to negative infinity because the negative x dominates the log x 
remember n is being held fixed. So since this goes to negative infinity, well, if logarithm of something is going to negative infinity, that means the something is going to zero. So that's a little more direct way to see that x to the n e to the minus x is going to zero. All right, so that's the first remark that, that e to the minus x is a transcendentally small term. Is there any question about the argument so far? Okay, so now why, why is that so important? Um, well, <laughs> so using this fact, about e to the minus x, let's suppose we wanted to write e to the minus x as an asymptotic series using inverse powers of x. Um, right, I mean, we're allowed to do that. If we wanted to write it as, maybe I should say it like this. Suppose I wanted to write it as a zero plus a one over x plus a two over x squared Right, I mean, that's a reasonable request to try to find the coefficients in an, the expression on the right, which is called an asymptotic power series because it's just powers of X. In powers of one over X. We will frequently have occasion to write things as asymptotic power series in one over X. In fact, in lecture one, such a thing popped out um, automatically, do you remember? I mean, in lecture one, just as a little reminder that in lecture one, we showed that this um, integral zero to infinity we did e to the minus xt over one plus t dt. We showed that that was asymptotic to one over x minus one factorial over x squared plus two factorial over x cubed minus three factorial over x to the fourth, et cetera. So just to make the point that very natural objects have asymptotic power series, this, this integral did. So you could ask, uh, what's the asymptotic power series for e to the minus x? And maybe you can guess the answer. If you try to calculate those coefficients, can you guess what's gonna happen? All the coefficients will be zero. They're all zero, <laughs> right? It's kind of a weird looking expression. Zero plus zero over X plus zero over X squared plus et cetera. And that, that really is legit. That's a correct expression. Um, it looks kind of bizarre to write it, uh, but it is legit because what it's, I mean, the thing you have to check is that the remainder term, I mean, what does it mean to write such an expression? You have to check that the remainder term is asymptotically smaller than the last term you retained, right? That's the test. And so the remainder, if you did this for any finite number of terms here, they're all zeros. So the remainder is always e to the minus x. And that is asymptotically smaller than the last retained term, which is always of the form one over X to the N. So, I mean, so this really is an asymptotic, um, this really does qualify as an asymptotic expansion. 
when I say this, I'm referring to this. It really does qualify. So what's so bizarre about that is it says that the function e to the minus x is asymptotically indistinguishable from the zero function. The function's at identically zero relative to this asymptotic sequence of inverse powers of x. So that's kind of crazy. And, and what it means then is that, um, This means that if I have, uh, suppose I have some asymptotic expansion for a function f of x as an asymptotic power series, say um, aj x to the minus j, j going from zero to infinity, right? So I have some asymptotic power series for f of x as x goes to infinity. If I have that, then g of x defined as this f plus say some constant times e to the minus x. So suppose I take my original function whose asymptotic power series I know and then add any amount of e to the minus x to it, including I could add 100 trillion billion trillion of e to the minus x to it. I mean, it could have a numerical prefactor c that's absolutely astronomical. Nevertheless, they will have the same asymptotic expansion. It has the same asymptotic expansion as x goes to infinity. So what this means is that um, in a sense, these e to the minus x terms or transcendentally small terms in general are invisible, undetectable. Um, to an asymptotic power series, you just won't see them. And they might be big as my example with the trillion, billion, trillion is supposed to make clear. So you can't assume they're numerically small, even though they're asymptotically invisible, they could cause big numerical errors if you try to evaluate a function by replacing it by an asymptotic approximation at some finite x. Okay, so hopefully you see the issue that um, this can cause big numerical errors and other trouble. Uh, at any finite x. If we approximate f of x with its asymptotic power series. So, it's meant to be a warning that you have to be aware of this possibility. Um, there, in fact, you know, when I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture of monsters under the bed, this is the thing I'm talking about. These subdominant terms, these transcendentally small terms. If they have big prefactors, they could really be trouble. They can also be qualitatively trouble. They can break symmetries. They can do all kinds of things. Um, and sometimes they, actually do all of that. Sometimes there is a monster under the bed, but usually there isn't, as you all know from experience <laughs> with beds. Um, so I'm going to tend to not worry about this too much, but from a rigorous standpoint, you have to be aware of it. Also, it's an interesting research frontier. So if you want to try to calculate these terms or estimate them, there are methods so you can learn about a, a very modern subject called hyperasymptotics, which I have never studied. But if you're curious about this, you could learn about it. Um, I it, on Twitter, or I posted uh, 
I mentioned that the first lecture was posted on YouTube. Um, it was mentioned that there are some nice review articles about hyperasymptotics by a guy named John Boyd. Um, I think it's John. Anyway, Boyd at University of Michigan. Maybe I'll post the link in the um, on our Canvas page. This field is also called um, asymptotics beyond all orders. Where beyond all orders is referring to all these powers of X. Past all the orders of all the powers of X, you get to these asymptotically transcendentally small terms, but you can handle them with these modern techniques. So I'm not gonna be talking about that, I don't think in this course, or maybe only at the very end, if we get to it. Okay, so, so now you are aware of transcendentally small terms. Um, and you might be wondering actually what's causing them. I mean, where are they coming from? If you've had a course in complex analysis, you may recognize what's going on here that um, Maria asked earlier about singularities. And you can see that like, the what's causing the trouble here is best understood in the complex plane. If you just think about e to the minus x as a function of a real variable x, it seems pretty mild. It's going to zero very fast. But if you think in the complex plane, rather than on the real line. The trouble is occurring because e to the minus z uh, has a very bad singularity at z equals infinity. It's not analytic at z equals infinity in the complex plane. In fact, it has what's called an essential singularity there. So there will be a couple points in the course where I'll talk about complex variables and ideas about singularities. Um, this is one of them. But so if you're not familiar with that, don't worry about it too much. Okay, anyone wanna ask anything at this point about transcendentally small terms or anything else? Okay, so as I say, they are a possibility that can cause trouble. They will come up. Sometimes they don't cause trouble. Sometimes they're, what's nice about them is that they're negligible in a certain sense. So we can introduce errors that happen to be transcendentally small and they don't hurt us because they don't change our asymptotic expansions. Anyway, um, let me conclude. We have about 15 minutes left. I just wanna make a few final remarks. Um, and then next time we'll be on to calculating stuff again and freewheeling, but but still continuing in this vein, let me tell you a few other things about asymptotics. I think I'm up to number five. You might be wondering about their arithmetic. Like, can you add them and subtract them and all that? Multiply them. Um, so asymptotic expansions have very nice arithmetic. Actually, they can be added or subtracted term by term added, subtracted, multiplied, um, divided, even integrated term by term. And um, everything will work fine. Meaning if you have two functions and you have asymptotic approximations to both of them, and uh, about the same base point, then you can figure out the asymptotic approximation, let's say for the product of those two functions by just multiplying term by term, the separate asymptotic approximations. So there's no problem with any of that. Um, integration works fine and arithmetic works fine. However, you do need to be careful um, with substitution and with differentiation. So you need to be wary of substitution 
and taking derivatives. So let me illustrate the kinds of trouble you can get into if you're not um, aware of the possible difficulties. So let's see, maybe I'll start a new page here. So let's see an example of what can go wrong with substitution, if you're naive. I mean, in practice, I don't find this ever causes any trouble, especially if you're working with Mathematica or, or some other symbolic manipulation program. Here's a little example of this, though, if you don't know what you're doing, what could happen. So as we have an f of x equal to e to the x squared and Let's suppose X depends on a small parameter epsilon as one over epsilon plus epsilon. Um, and I'm interested in thinking about the limit as X goes to zero or consider what happens as epsilon goes to zero. And of course that means that X is going to infinity since X is one over epsilon leading term, right? So X is blowing up like one over epsilon. And then we're taking F of X and we wanna understand how does F of X behave approximately for small epsilon? So let's first do it exactly. Since this is a contrived example, we can just do it exactly. Um, the exact result, would say that f of x of epsilon is, I'm taking the exponential of x squared. So that's one over epsilon squared plus two plus epsilon squared. And so now I can group everything. I mean, I could factor that as e to the one over epsilon squared e squared, e to the epsilon squared. And next you could keep in mind, like suppose I just want the dominant behavior for small epsilon. What's the leading term? There's, I mean, you might recognize this term has an essential singularity at epsilon equals zero. That's sort of behaving like e to the infinity. This one's we'd better just leave this term alone. E squared is just some constant, but this term e to the epsilon squared, we could expand in a Maclaurin series. As um, one plus epsilon squared plus one over two factorial epsilon to the fourth plus, et cetera. All right, that's just from here. And then picking off, since we're only interested in the epsilon goes to zero limit, we see that the leading behavior is e squared times e to the one over epsilon squared. So that would give us an asymptotic approximation to f of x of epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. All right, so that's exact. But let's suppose we say that's a lot of work. Um, and after all, look at this expression up here, x of epsilon is, I mean, think about this for small epsilon. Like suppose epsilon is one one millionth, then one over epsilon would be a million. And then we add a correction term of one millionth, right? Which is, so it's like a trillion times smaller than the leading term. So that seems like, oh, come on, that's kind of gotta be negligible, doesn't it? So what if you just neglect it? Um, watch the trouble you can get into. It seems like it should be harmless, <laughs> but you can have trouble. However, 
if we naively write that um, x of epsilon, which is exactly one over epsilon plus epsilon is asymptotic to one over epsilon as epsilon goes to zero and then substitute that in. That is, if we take the asymptotic first, and then substitute, right? You realize I've, I've done things in the opposite order. First, in the correct calculation, I substituted first, then I did the asymptotics. Here, I'm doing the asymptotics first and then substituting. So if I do that, I'm gonna get something wrong. Um, I'll get F of X of epsilon. Um, well, what would I have? I'd say it's, X of, what was I doing? F was just e to the X squared. So I would write X of whatever this thing is squared, but that's wrong. Because compare the two results. I mean, the right answer has that prefactor of E squared. Whereas this has a prefactor of one. So we've done something wrong um, and I just told you what it was. The leading term has the wrong prefactor. So that's a, meant to be a chastening example. Um, the lesson, I mean, the lesson you could take from this is that in exponentials, which is what we were dealing with here, um, you may need to keep higher order terms or higher order than you might think. So like when I refer to higher order terms, I'm thinking here of, it wasn't enough to just keep this asymptotically dominant term of one over epsilon. I did need this higher order term of epsilon in order to get the right answer. Um, we need to keep the higher order terms in the exponent. Not just the leading order terms. And then uh, recall that the sine function and the cosine function are themselves exponentials. If you think in the complex plane, you can write sine and cosine in terms of exponentials. Same thing with sinh and cosh. So all of those have this same issue. Um, so the same is true for sine cosine, sinh, cosh. They're all essentially exponentials in the complex plane. So they all suffer from this effect. Though I don't find in the modern world, this is really much trouble because I do these calculations in Mathematica and it's no problem to keep as many terms as I feel like keeping. So, but back in the days when people did a lot of things by hand, they would sometimes slip up on this. Okay, so I'm gonna finish with one other remark. Is there any question about this? Actually, we saw an instance of this much earlier in the lecture when I was doing um, that dopey calculation where I tried to expand square root of nine plus epsilon in terms of sine and sine squared. And we had some coefficients that were a little messed up. Let me just scroll back to that to point something out. So it was here on um, in Mathematica. Well, that's maybe not the best place to look at it. <laughs> 
I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking you could, if you were very naive, you might think, why don't I just replace this cosine, do a substitution, replace this by its asymptotic behavior of one, replace this by epsilon, replace this by epsilon squared. If you just did that substitution immediately, you would be led to think that the coefficients here should be the same as what you would get if you just did the power series to begin with. But as we saw, that didn't work. They had different coefficients. And if it's for the same reason, it's because of these sines and cosines needing care. Okay, so anyway, last remark is about differentiation. So finally, Um, differentiation can cause trouble. To, so consider this example. Suppose f of x is um, x plus sine of x. Then as x goes to infinity, f of x is asymptotic to x. Right, because the ratio of f of x over x goes to one. All right, so f of x is asymptotic to x, but what if I now try differentiating that asymptotic relationship? If I take f prime of x, the correct answer is f prime of x is one plus cosine of x. That's if I differentiate f and then take, uh, and then look for asymptotic behavior. And second, if I do asymptotic behavior first and try differentiating this expression after I've done the asymptotics, I would say I might falsely predict that f prime of x is asymptotic to one. So yet differentiating this asymptotic relationship falsely predicts f prime of x would be asymptotic to one. And this is wrong, right? I mean, because this is not asymptotic to one. Think about this expression as x goes to infinity. This expression has no limit as x goes to infinity. And if I take f of x and or f prime of x and divide it by one, it still, it has no limit. This term continues to oscillate. So, um, I mean, it is wrong. F prime of X is not asymptotic to one. I'll put a slash through it. So again, what's causing the trouble? It's this, that sine of X has an essential singularity at infinity. That's the problem. Um, Trouble is that sine z. Has an essential singularity at z equals infinity. Still, there are gonna be times that we will want to differentiate asymptotic relationships. And we can get away with that. There are theorems that say when you're allowed to do that. These things are called Tauberian theorems. They give you permission to differentiate asymptotic formulas. You can read about them in Bender and Orsog on page 127. I'm not gonna state any of them really. I mean, just to give you a flavor maybe of what they are. So roughly they say things like this. 
you can look up in more rigorous books for what the precise statement is, or I think maybe Bender and Orsag give a good statement. So like, here's one version. If you have f of z analytic in some sector of the complex plane. So by sector, I mean something that, you know, looks like this. Um, in some sector of the complex plane, then it's okay to differentiate term by term there. So that's one case where you can get away with it. Um, another is also if you have um, f of z and f prime of z, if they have asymptotic expansions, in one of these phi j asymptotic sequences, um, then it's okay to differentiate term by term. So that wasn't true for the one plus sine uh, x or whatever it was, x plus cosine x example. All right, so as you can see, this isn't really my favorite kind of thing to be talking about. I wanna just calculate stuff, but um, just to avoid consorting with the devil too much, uh, I thought I really ought to tell you about some of these subtle points. And, as, and I, like I said, transcendentally small terms will come back in fact, we'll see them, I think we'll see them in the next lecture um, in the context of asymptotic expansion of integrals, which is our next topic. Okay, so see you then.